7.30. I'd like to call the order the, uh, to order the minute, meeting of the minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it'll uh, make, make humor there. Uh, Arlington Finance Committee. Uh, the first thing I just want to mention is that uh, I want to make sure all the Finance Committee members that are not town meeting members get a copy of the Finance Committee report. Uh, since it was mailed out this time instead of at the back, some of you might not have. Uh, Gloria has a few extra copies in the back. Uh, if you decided to do something different, it's nice and white uh, on that. But uh, check, with, check with Gloria to make sure you get, uh, get one. Uh, there's a resolution that uh, Percy uh, from the school committee uh, put forth for us to review and, and uh, see if we could endorse it. Uh, if we have time at the end of this meeting, we could do it or people could read it and we could do it uh, tomorrow. Uh, article 31. Uh, this was the article we put in every year to say, you know, we adopt any regulations or statutes that the state has recently passed that allows us to raise additional revenues. Uh, uh, this year, uh, the selectmen thought we voted on it. The finance committee, I thought, the selectmen had voted on it. So, of course, nobody voted on it. Uh, it. It's a routine thing. We get to it. If nothing has come out of either the governor's budget or the house budget, uh, then we usually just, you know, vote no action. Uh, that's the case. There's nothing in the governor's budget or the house budget or uh, pending that would allow us to raise more revenue. So I would request a, a, vote, a motion of no action uh, so that when we get to that, I could make that motion before town meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any questions? Okay, all those in favor of no action on Article 30, uh, 31, we say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Okay, the minutes. Uh, minutes have been presented. Uh, do I have any motions, corrections, questions? Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes were approved unanimously. Okay, now we get to the main issue for tonight. As I emailed you earlier, uh, the uh, meeting this morning of the special task force set up by the selectmen to uh, uh, make a recommendation uh, met this morning uh, on the task force were myself, uh, Charlie Foskett, Steve DeCourcy, uh, along with uh, Dan Dunn as chair. Uh, Joe Curl was there, Alan Reedy from the Permanent Town Building Committee, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I cannot remember. Uh, from the, uh, who's the representative on the Minutemen Building Committee? Uh, two representatives, or was it one representative from the school committee? Uh, Paul Schlickman, uh, who was replaced, because Paul had to leave early by uh, uh, Jeff Thielman. Uh, I miss anybody? She wasn't there, Kathy wasn't there. Uh, and Adam Chaplin was there. Uh, I'm sorry, oh yes. And the uh, two gentlemen from Minuteman who were just here for overtime. Uh, 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 were there as they as they have been uh, in in many meetings in the town of Arlington, uh, and the uh, the task force uh, voted to approve a uh, vote um, of favorable action on the Minuteman building project, specifically contingent upon a proposition two and a half ballot vote. So. Uh, before you should be legal opinions from Bond Council and from our own attorney, uh, some information that I could go through later. Uh, and I asked 
uh, Dan Dunn to come and, and tell us more specifically what happened and why. Oh, and welcome to Chef Burke from uh, the Minuteman School Committee. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm, as you know, I'm Dan Dunn. Uh, the, the task force that the selectmen was created, I have appeared to talk about, I believe that I mentioned this the last time I was here uh, talking to this group. And it's partly just simply because we don't have a good mechanism in town for thinking about projects that are outside of our regular uh, school or municipal building projects. We have a lot of uh, built-in systems like our Permanent Town Building Committee and the Capital Planning Committee and the Finance Committee, the School Committee and the town, uh, our Town Manager for evaluating building projects that occur entirely within Arlington. But when we talk about a uh, group project w across multiple towns, we, don't have a, we haven't done it to my knowledge since 1973 and uh, we don't have a lot of practice at it. So we uh, created the task force of people who are fairly knowledgeable about Minuteman and or building and or education to look at whether or not to recommend the Minuteman building uh, project. And uh, I don't, it wasn't an easy path for us and I don't think, and I think that many of the members, um, myself included, were, uh, had a hard time deciding about whether or not the building was right for Arlington and then in the end by a vote of 8 to 1 this morning we did recommend uh, that we would uh, to, to recommend to both the finance committee and to the board of selectmen to uh, go ahead and build the Minuteman uh, recommend the, the Minuteman building project and I think I'm, I'm going to rely a little bit on more probably and I would say different people came to that conclusion for different reasons uh, but, but we were all working from the same body of you know emails and paper that you have all been seeing as it goes by. <clears throat> and I'm going to tour you briefly through my con particular reasons. I think that they were shared by other members of, of the committee, but uh, I think different people, like I said, had, had different reasons. I think about, uh, look, I stopped looking at Minuteman, the rebuild, Minuteman rebuild about the how and how we're going to get things done. And I started thinking about it, what is it that we actually want to happen in the end? And I started to think about what are the outcomes that are likely or, and w what are the outcomes that are desired in terms of a Minuteman rebuild decision. <clears throat> and there are kind of two big ones. One is that we participate, that the, a building happens. And the other one is that the new building doesn't happen. And we, through the various, uh, through our town uh, meeting authority and through the authority within the new regional agreement, we effectively could stop the building from happening if we chose to do so. And so it really becomes down to us to say whether or not we want the building to happen or whether we want to stop this new building from happening. So if you think about the outcomes within the building actually happening, there's, you know, the, the outcomes range from poor to great with good in between. And good is, is that all of the um, predictions turn out more uh, uh, reasonably as well as uh, we hope that they will. Great is that they turn out better than we think that they will. And uh, some of the math that Al has passed out that came in through um, work from Kevin at the Minuteman, which has also been largely confirmed by Sandy, the, uh, a pooler, is that the range is 1.2 to 1.0, was it 1.2 to 1.7 million per year is what the, you know, 1.2 would be good, 1.7 would be bad, and there's a few outside, uh, you know, the, the school truly fails that would be even worse than that. So those are like the, the build, the, and, and when you do that, you get a good building, you get uh, 628 students that is uh, appropriate for the, a good educa vocational education program. On the other side, you've got the don't build the building plan. And I outlined that out as a, uh, kind of an A through E. A is what would, would be really great if it was available, which is the cheap renovation. If it turns out that it's possible to do for small money, keep Minuteman going and uh, with, as a successful school. Then there's the expensive renovation. Uh, it, in the expensive renovation, you know, the paper that the Minuteman uh, Building Committee provided says $100 million. $100 million is not, doesn't get a lot of uh, traction, I think, in terms of people believing that that really is the cost of what the renovation would be. But I think that it, the thing that really got me to yes was discounting was comparing, that, uh, comparing how much money we'd pay for the new building and then thinking how much we would have to pay in renovation. And if we do 
but so the, the new building is 145 million, the state kicks in 44 million, that leaves approximately 100 million dollars to be borne by the people sending kids. It, with the new state regulation, we can drop that 100 million by taking out of discharging out of district students a capital fee. And that's something that wasn't possible before. And that potentially could drop that 100 million that the, the, the district has to pay down to 80 million if that, you know, if the, depending upon how the predictions actually work. If it's then, uh, and Arlington's on the hook for, depending upon how many students we send, say a third of that 80 million dollars. So call it 25 million dollars, call it 30 million dollars, <coughs> we're on the hook for that we have to pay. Now, how much renovation dollars do there have to be before, you know, we've already exceeded that 25 million dollars? Because remember, if we go the renovation route, there is no state assistance, and we cannot charge the out-of-district fee. The out-of-district fee can only be charged for math school building authority buildings. And so one of the opinions that I relied on was um, uh, Alan Reedy, and Alan Reedy had reviewed the Minuteman documents, and he kind of said, you know, I don't see a great path to a cheap renovation either. Sure, you can do the renovation for small money, but then when you have to replace this system, and then you have to replace that system, and then you have to replace this system, then you're going to break all the, the thresholds where you have to put in more ADA money, and there isn't a cheap renovation. So those, that's where I'd, I came to believe that the cheap renovation didn't really exist. I came to believe the expensive renovation would cost us the same as a new building, but in the end, we wouldn't have a new building. We'd have an inferior product. And so that's where, that's what, in terms of outcomes and desired outcomes, that's where I came to. Just for the sake of completeness, I'll just briefly talk about some of the other options, which would be dissolving Minuteman, trying to rebuild a new uh, district, uh, you know, form a new school with Belmont and Lexington and Watertown, invite someone like Everett and rebuild it on the Mugar property. You know, there's a million ideas of things that one could hypothetically do, but we don't have the leadership, we don't have the, we don't have the dedication, we don't have, there's no one who's up uh, chomping at the bit to say, this is the path that we have to go forward. And instead, what we've done is we've created this new district we think can really uh, succeed with better governance with uh, the 10 towns that we have. So that's, um, uh, that's my, my combination report of the committee and uh, my personal thoughts of, of uh, how I got to the place that I did. Thank you. Any questions? As long as you want. Okay. Um, Mr. So, uh, as you know, as a member of the Benjamin School Committee, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add? Road. Uh, it took a couple of years, but they have achieved it. That gives me some confidence in this. The natural demographics, um, the move toward the more sophisticated approach, like I said, especially in the Boston areas, like the Boston area, there's no question. That is a national movement, there's a national need for it, which I believe will have will be a factor in increasing in-district enrollment at Minuteman. I certainly think that a new building will do a lot to attract students that perhaps now don't even consider Minuteman. Um, I, I think that of the alternatives, the new building is the one that speaks to me the most. I think having the new equipment, the new academy model there, which is what the build, new building would allow us to go to, Reducing the physical size of the building and the costs, the energy costs and whatnot that would go down with that. There's a lot of positive things that would come with a new building at a price. I believe it's the alternative that we should take very seriously. Okay. Uh, the superintendent and the director of uh, finance, uh, assistant superintendent, uh, are here to answer any questions that you have. Um, the materials that you have in front of you, I think I handed these out before, but the two spreadsheets, basically I asked Kevin to run them so we could see what happens with the original scenario, which is where um, it was about two-thirds member uh, students, one-third uh, out-of-district students. And that had a uh, about a million two impact from the uh, from the project. Now what happens if the uh, school district is overwhelmingly successful and all the students come from the district? 
and let's say the same percentage of those 628 is from Arlington, what is the top side from that? And, and that's the other run that uh, actually just got tonight. Uh, and that is about a million seven thirty one. So we're talking a million two to a million seven, you know, give or take. Obviously, if our percentage is higher, the number is higher. If the percentage is lower, it's lower. Um, and but at least then you, you have sort of a parameter uh, that that's it's somewhere between that two uh, is the impact. Uh, the other sheet you have, I think, is just the other, all the other cities and or cities, all the other towns that are members uh, or even leaving uh, the status that they are as far as the uh, uh, projection. The legal, the opinion from town council and uh, from bond council uh, supporting that uh, a, a contingent vote, even when the referendum is after the 60-day period. Um, if that referendum passes, or if that referendum is defeated, then the bond council considers that a no vote from the town of Arlington and will not allow the bonds to be issued. So uh, I think several people requested that because it was sort of not directly intuitive when you just look at the statute. Um, it's, it's when you look at a couple together. Um, from my point of view, I think uh, I'd recommend this uh, for, for probably the reasons that, that Dan went through, and I throw it open to the, uh, to the committee now for either questions for any of the people attending or for uh, <coughs> uh, to state your point of view and, and how you want to proceed. So, John? Yeah, just so I understand. And could people speak up? Remember, this room is really lousy. Just so I can understand. So. The, it's the it's the opinion of our town council and bond council that a contingent yes does not irrevocably lock us into bonding if the debt exclusion fails. That's correct. Okay, thank you. That's correct. And it's bond council that has to approve to provide the legal opinion for the bonds. So if he says or she says no, then that's it. Bond Council is also the town of Arlington's Bond Council. Okay, Dean? I, I, I think there's probably a, a better question for the Minuteman folks, but I, I just, <coughs> I, I can't understand. I, I, could they walk through how this bonding actually works on a mechanical level? And because I always hear, well, we're, we're going to bond it. So how do we, I, I don't, I, I just don't understand it because they have to be bonding it, and then are we paying it back, and then <coughs> we're, we have to be bonding it at a percentage of enrollment, but if our enrollment changes over time, there's a reconciliation. If our borrowing rate and their borrowing rate are differently, how does that work? I, I just like a, a okay, general sure. understanding of how it works. The Minuteman Regional School District is the bonding authority. <coughs> they will issue the bonds on their own credit, and their credit is based upon really the sort of combined credit of the, uh, of the 10 communities. Uh, they will be responsible for paying the debt service. They then turn around and according to the formula in the, regional, the new regional school agreement, which is uh, they will assess the member of towns in operating and a capital charge. The capital charge is our share of the debt service. Uh, half of the, in the assessment formula in the new agreement, Half of the charge is based on a four-year rolling average of enrollment. One percent uh, is based upon, uh, or ten percent really, one percent for each community. Uh, everybody pays the same. That's your, your share for being there. The balance is a, is, is a wealth-based uh, formula. Uh, so they issue the bonds and then charge back to us according to the regional agreement uh, a capital assessment. Uh, which we pay, they take, and they pay the bonds. So, now I'm just going to jump to sort of fill in the gap. So, <coughs> under, under that model, if we approve this, if we have a debt exclusion, if it passes, we never actually borrow the money. The debt exclusion in this scenario, in this scenario that you're explaining is actually just used as a mechanism when we set the tax rate to raise the money to pay it? Right. 
In other words, we're just like we do with the, we're probably doing with the middle school or the high school, uh, the debt exclusion exempts from the limits of Prop 2 and a half, the debt service. But, but, but that's a little different because the debt actually goes on. To, we actually borrow the money ourselves. Under this scenario, we're not borrowing the money. No. They're borrowing the money. It's for our share of the debt service. If you, uh, Read the vote in the bond councils in the uh, uh, town council's opinion. Uh, this approval shall be contingent upon a successful vote of the town to exempt its allocable share of debt service on this project from the limitations of Prop Two and a Half. So our annual share instead of right. I get it. That so they give us a bill for pick a number uh, a million dollars, then uh, that basically passes directly through to the taxpayer. All right, so. I guess my, ne my next question, and maybe it's, I guess I'm starting to understand since we're not borrowing it, is I guess then as a member community, we'd be secondarily liable for the, for the debt in the event something happened, right, to the school or, or, or whatnot, but we're not primarily liable. And what I was getting at with that is, and it, on its face, it might sound preposterous when I say this, but between all the projects coming through and the timing of the high school rebuild, we're gonna get pretty <coughs> high up on that debt limit, the state debt limit for the town. I mean, we're gonna probably at one point go well over 50% of our borrowing. So if we were primary law, the only reason I'm asking this is just to make sure is we had a, it, it, it does matter at some point, right? If we were in line with a whole number, it would be, it'd be a problem. But this debt service will go on whatever. But it's theirs, because we're secondarily. Okay. And so, uh, you know, if, if Minuteman fails to pay the debt service, the first thing they do probably is seize the superintendent's house. But, uh, <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's based on the credit of the, uh, of the district. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Other questions, opinions, however? Uh, Paul, Bill, Frank. Um, I have a few, few questions here. Um, first off, when Dan spoke, you said, you talked about the money that other district students would pay uh, towards the capital. Is, are these numbers, 1.2 million or 1.6 million per year, are they based assuming that we would get some amount? Or is that assuming we would get no amount from out of district students? Um, the model that was originally passed out um, that shows that uh, Arlington's obligation would be about a million two. It's based on 170 out of district students paying the $8,400 per student. That revenue is then applied to offset debt service. Okay, thank you. The model that we passed out <coughs> tonight assumes all in district students. Um, my second question was who voted <coughs> no this morning? Mr. Foskett. Um, and my third question, and there may not be anyone here to answer it. In, in looking at the costs per student for sending someone to Minuteman with, with this new um, cost on top of it, um, and comparing that to Arlington, what an Arlington High School cost per student <coughs> is, do we have any kind of estimate as to a fully loaded Arlington High School student cost given pensions and insurance and capital. Nobody's behind me now. <laughs> Charlie, you want to take a, a published number by the DESE of what? 12,000 or 13,000. Oh, sir, can you speak up? <coughs> Sorry, don't we have a published number by the DESE of 12 or 13,000 per student, including capital and other ancillary costs. So that, that, that number And I think we're talking costs. about 13, uh, 30 some thousand right. here. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Bill. Uh, so thank you. I, uh, boy, I, you know, I'm on the finance committee and I can imagine how difficult this whole project scenario has been for Swuckman and the task force 
to uh, my mind my, my mind keeps going back and forth but one thing that I just keep coming back to are some of the numbers that just just don't sit right with me and I just want to put that out there and see maybe I'm looking at things the wrong way um, in the email that I got today the enrollment argument stated that enrollments at Minuteman are on the order of 700 students the proposed school has a target of 628 that we talked about now those are really two different categories of students, though, aren't they? In other words, the 700 students aren't, uh, these aren't total member towns. This is the total projection for students that are, that are in, the, in the building, which could uh, include out of town, right? Right, I think that, yes, I think the 628 and the 700 are both composed of both sources. As in both, the 628 will be both in and out of district, and the 700 is both in and out of district. Okay, because one of the one of the financial forms that got circulated shows the 628 was all total member towns, and non-member towns was zero. And so that the figure used to calculate um, how many students we might need from in town in order to make this viable <coughs> was 628. So just to, um, bear, bear with me for a second. So what I did is I just simply took an average of the last six years of uh, total member towns, and um, I came up with uh, I came up with um, 420. I did the same thing with Arlington over the last six years, and I came up with 138. To get to the two figures respectively of 200 Arlington and 628 total in town is between a 45 and 50% increase. So I guess my question is, is the, the way we built this 45 to 50% increase really wasn't from the bottom up, it was from kind of the top down. This is a figure that we really need to have in order for this to be viable and for it to be uh, financially uh, viable. But, how do we know we're going to get the 45% to 50% increase in Arlington students and as well as in-town students to sort of hit this, uh, this, this number that you're looking for? And so that was one of the questions I had. And do you want to take these one at a time? Yeah. yeah okay. So, uh, I would, so I would completely, I personally, and I think other members of the task force would absolutely agree to you over with you that it is that uh, it doesn't make sense to count on filling the school with in-district students. So that run that I think you're referring to, where it has zero out of district, was uh, Al had requested that run so that we could look at a range of <coughs> possibilities. And so I'm sure that the superintendent is more optimistic than I am that the in-district students' enrollment will go up but I'm advocating this building on the basis that I believe that we can fill the 628 with a combination of in and out of district students. So I, I, my personal belief is in, you know, if you can see farther than five, 10, 15, you know, 30 years of the future and what the enrollment is, then let's grab that crystal ball and use it. But my personal belief is, is that we're gonna be able to find 628 <coughs> students to come. That's in and out. In and out. Okay, because there's different, uh, there's different financials for each group, obviously, correct? Yeah. Yep. Very different financials. financials. Would you like uh, perhaps the superintendent to answer that enrollment or respond to that enrollment question? Possibly, yeah, sure. Ed? Sure, thank you. Sure, yeah, I think in the, in the short term, uh, given where we're at right now and that we're, if everything passes, we're three years away from entering into a new building, we will not fill that new building the first day with 628 or more students just from the 10 remaining member towns. And that's absolutely the reality of that. The other reality is that we're seeing an increase in just the population of students in our largest sending communities, as you're dealing with in Arlington. I've read the Arlington enrollment trends and they're predicting a 14% increase by uh, fiscal year 20 which is when this building would open. If you look at some of the, when we look back at, and I've also looked at the highs and lows 
of in-district and out-of-district. Arlington, for instance, just four years ago sent 165 students. Um, um, this year, eighth graders are applying for entry into the ninth grade. From our member towns, those applications are up about 15% as of today, and we're still accepting applications for three, three more months or so. Um, the other approach that we've taken with marketing and recruiting and retaining students seems to be bearing fruit even though we haven't completed a full year of all these activities. One bellwether of that, which was encouraging this fall, we go around to all of our member town middle schools <coughs> and talk to students. We have students talk to other students and they raise their hand if they're interested in visiting Minuteman. A year ago we had about 350 kids total from all the eighth graders raised their hands. This year we had over a thousand kids raise their hands and actually 400 of them came to Minuteman and visited. Uh, we had a dinner with the teacher uh, a couple of weeks ago where our incoming eighth graders come with their parents and families and have dinner with the teacher. Uh, we had almost 300 uh, family members there, over 110 kids. So we're seeing a lot more interest in vocational technical education in general. But your premise is correct. We're not going to fill the school with member town only for several years. The other thing is Minuteman, if this school goes through and it's built new, it's only the fourth new vocational school built in the last 10 years. Worcester, Springfield, and then the, the merger of Essex Aggie, Peabody Voke, and North Shore Regional. Within a year or two of those schools opening, they all had waiting lists of 100, 200, um, students where prior to that they were struggling to fill their school and I think that's not a reflection of the jazziness of a new building it's a reflection of the buildings being built now are reflective of the educational programming requirements of innovative and high-tech vocational technical education and that's compelling and attractive just like when a student visits a college uh, campus and <coughs> is compelled by some of the things they see and thank you Okay, thank you. Uh, so I guess uh, I really don't have a second question, maybe more of an observation, is that it is, uh, I was thinking this is sort of like build it and they will come. But it's only partly that, it's what you're saying. And the other part is demographics and enrollment trends and programs within the new school that is going to up the enrollment, as well as the pizzazz, if you will, of a, of a school. And as Sue uh, mentioned, there's a tremendous interest in career and technical education from families that I've never seen in my whole career. Parents coming and asking questions I've always wanted to hear, but I've never heard, where they're thinking about the return on investment for college and career tech ed is becoming a, a way for kids to try out college majors and, and some of the minds of the families that are coming, and it's true. Great. Thank you. Is that OK? Um, Brian? Um, I have a question. Basically, um, I'm curious how you got to the $8,600 figure for the out-of-district um, capital cost. Because if you simply just take 628 divided by the total cost, it costs about $9,200, um, We came to that uh, calculation based upon the regulation that was uh, put into effect in March of 2015. And the intent of the regulation is to allow a, a, a regional district such as Minuteman to charge what the average um, capital costs are for its members to the non-members. So we use the, uh, and I should say the regulation has sort of two dimensions. If a, com a student comes from a community like Watertown, for instance, that has no vocational programs of their own, they pay 100% of that average. If a student comes to us from Medford or Waltham, where they have five or more vocational technical programs, state approved, they would pay 75% of that average. So we use the conservative number for these <coughs> calculations. Um, I have actually a question for Mr. Dunn. Uh, you mentioned what is the uh, opinion of the selectmen on this project? taking into consideration everything this town is facing financially, and specifically I'll refer to the five-year plan, um, approximately 2021, 
um, there's going to be a huge deficit, not, even, not discounting any of the projects that are coming up. Yeah. So, uh, two parts to the answer. First is that the Board of Selectmen has not taken opinion, uh, taken a position on this project. And uh, it created the task force because it did, um, it, you know, I don't think we, we, did, we recognized we didn't have the expertise of the five, uh, among the five of us. Uh, they have, the board has on more than one occasion um, respected my recommendations and opinions on this because I've been so immersed in it. And Joe Kiro has been also very immersed in it, and he shares my opinion. So I think that the answer is, is that I've got, I can count to two, and I need to get, you know, <coughs> am I going to get to five? We'll, you know, we'll see. The second half of that about like what does it look like in the big picture? I think we are <coughs> acutely aware of that, and uh, I don't know if you had a chance to re to read. We took a vote to put the uh, debt exclusion on the ballot for June 14, and that motion very explicitly covers both the past, talking about the two de uh, overrides that we've done, it talks about the present with the current enrollment, and it talks about the future, and it articulates that this debt exclusion that we're doing or the, or on June 14th is one of three significant uh, uh, um, votes that we're going to ask the town to take over the coming years. Uh, there's the, you know, the, this one that we're talking about right now, Thompson Middle School, uh, Arlington High School Feasibility Minuteman. The second step, excuse me, is the full Arlington High School build. And the third step is the operating override. So acutely aware of the, uh, of, the of, of that package. Because I've tried to speculate as to what these numbers are gonna be. And it's clearly gonna be in excess of 20, over the next five years, it's clearly gonna be in excess of 20 to $25 billion additional over where we are today. For the third step. For everything okay. combined. Okay. I, I assume the school will be about, the you know, high school will be somewhere around $9 million a year. Ball, ball, I don't know, I don't know what you say, I haven't seen the numbers. I'm just ballparking it. This is going to be one and a half million, say. And the, if you're going to actually do another override budget, so much of what we did um, last time, that number I calculated to be somewhere between 16 and 18 million dollars a year. Yeah. I, I, I don't have enough of a command of the numbers to tell you, correct, but I'll say, uh, just as a help, is that Sandy Pooler has been working a lot on an estimator for these things, and um, he sent around a draft of it at the Long Range Planning Committee, and I should forward, we should get that into your hands so you can you know, compare and make sure your number is compared to his, correct? Uh, I Thank you. Okay, Brian. Uh, Charlie. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. So, um, <clears throat> you heard um, after the <coughs> false question that the lone opposing vote at the meeting today uh, was uh, yours truly. And um, <clears throat> you, you received an email from me while I was away uh, expressing um, many of my concerns with this project. And I'd like to go through those with you in a little bit more detail tonight. And <clears throat> I'd like to start out by saying that, um, uh, that, that, that Bill Keller was close to, to, or actually quite accurate in saying that this project is a you know build it and they will come concept. Um, we're really facing two things here. For, I, I, I first of all want to deny uh, the, the assumption or the, or the supposition that um, Dan Dunn presented us with that this is a vote to build this new building or stop the building. That's a, a pejorative way to position it. We really have a question before us whether we build new with an expensive building and even after the MSB, MSBA reimbursement, sign up for $100 million worth of debt. I'm talking about the entire uh, community here. Or we follow a, a renovate and build project, which can and probably will cost us substantially less. And I'll come back to that issue in a second. Experience tells us, and I'm looking at the 15-year historical enrollment data published in this year's um, financial package from Minuteman, which I got off the web today. In 2004, the total member town 
uh, attendance, our member, uh, town, member town student enrollment was 522 students. In 2015, it was 390 students. And if you look at the d data from year to year, it bounces around a little bit, but it's been on a steady decline. Now we just had, I think it's five towns exit from the agreement. And if you look at the numbers that those five towns contributed to the enrollment, it comes to about 48 students in 2015. So that means without those five towns, and, and maybe some of them will come in as out of district students, but they will also have the choice to go to other districts. And um, many of those districts surrounding the town, uh, surrounding the Miniman district, have vacancies in their vocational educational program. So we could lose as many as 48 students from the 390 students that we had this year. So the, the build it and they will come leap gets ever higher. Now, there is another concern that I have with respect to the out of district students. First of all, there's an assumption here which defies logic to me that if the out of district students have to suddenly pay a capital fee that they're going to leap at going <coughs> to, to Miniman. And every other experience I've had in life says that when you come to a big price increase in something, you look for a less expensive alternative. And I, and I believe that the out of district students will look for a less expensive alternative. So based on the increase, already we're talking about a school that has one of the highest, if not the highest, per pupil cost among all the vocational educational uh, vocational educational schools and uh, districts in the state, we're now going to be adding another $9,000 or $10,000 a year to that cost. So I don't, I think based on the cost alone, we're going to lose out of district students. And then finally, um, as, we, as uh, we discussed today, and as we, uh, as I mentioned to you in my email, recent changes at the DSE, uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, department in, in, uh, in Boston restrict, makes it, makes it more difficult for out of district students to, to leave their own district if they have certain programs in their district so that freshman students may be pushed back into sophomore year before they could switch to Miniman. And I think many of us here have had experiences with uh, children uh, with children both you know at the elementary level and at the high school level and we know at the high school level kids bond with their friends and neighbors and their schoolmates so anticipating that after a year of bonding these kids are going to suddenly make a jump to to leave their surroundings that they've grown comfortable with and also uh, be encouraged to go to a more expensive school system because of the increased capital cost, defies logic to me. So I think, um, I think the, the trend of member towns attending the district is going down. And I think the possibility or the expectation that out of district students are going to increase is a triumph of hope over experience. Now one of the main arguments that the Minuteman district has made with respect to why we have to spend this hundred million dollars on a new school is because the alternative is so expensive and it's going to cost us the same. The first comment I want to make is that the work that was done on this was based on what I would call back of the envelope, square foot analysis. And the school enrollment task force already rejected in, with respect to Arlington's projects that sort of approach to estimating the cost of school renovation or rebuilding. The second uh, comment I would make is that at this morning's meeting, I asked Superintendent Boquillon why we were using a 6% inflation rate um, in, the, in escalating the cost, the, the future cost of this renovation program, as opposed to a 2 to 3% inflation rate, which is what the MSBA uses when they calculate future uh, building costs. And I was explicitly told that we didn't use a 6% inflation rate, we used a 3% inflation rate. So I went back and I looked at the, 
at this document, which is the, I, I think it's the right one, it says, non -F report of the non-MSBA building plan subcommittee of the Minuteman School Building Committee. And on page nine, it says, construction cost adjusted 6% for 2014, one year escalation. And then later it says, and, and I, I went through this and I made some, some detailed calculations. And then later it says, the escalation start of construction, 10%. So that first of all, the first year is escalated by 6%, and then it's escalated again by 10% for the first year start of construction. What I'm getting at is these numbers are padded. These are not <coughs> reflective of the real cost of renovating the school system. And then it says 6% per annum to midpoint of construction. So we're again applying a 6% inflation rate to the instruction, construction costs on, on each of these years. So it's no surprise that, and then there's another um, mystifying thing to me which I haven't had a chance to investigate, but there's something in here called general conditions. 8.4 million added to the 45 million trade cost uh, uh, contract, and then in the in the this is for the, um, for the for the minimum build program, and then if it's um, built, including the um, the um, changes to, to to meet the new educational plan requirements, there's another. Essentially, it's double. Another 8.4 million dollars added, so that's 60 million 800 thousand dollars added to the basic $77 million. So it's no wonder that we come to 100 million or 100, in this case, 100, the bottom line is $141 million renovation cost. I mean, I think that, I don't think that the school district has done the appropriate amount of due diligence in evaluating how to get a good rebuild and renovation program accomplished at, at, a, at a reasonable price. Now I did a, I did a comparison just just uh, just an, uh, a quick run comparing the numbers using a three percent versus the six percent um, um, escalations that they have in here uh, in, in on this sheet and the difference is accumulates to about sixteen percent in the total cost so so in the first column where you're dealing at the bottom line here is seventy one million dollar cost it actually should be sixty one million dollars so. You know, on, on the basis, I, I mean, I, I think that the, the argument that this is gonna cost all this additional money, you know, we've had, we've renovated schools here in Arlington very successfully, on time and on budget. We have built new schools, but we've also renovated schools. So renovation is not such a, uh, you know, completely ridiculous alternative. And I've been through the building of Minutemen on many occasions, and I think the building is, you know, it's not that, in that bad shape. It's in a lot better shape than Arlington High School. And, and there's a, enough space there that this can be renovated over time and provide alternative, um, alternative uh, uh, conditions for, for, for new educational programs. So um, I, I oppose this, this uh, motion, among other reasons, because it's gonna, if, if town meeting votes for this, it's gonna imply that town meeting supports this, the spending of this a uh, hundred million dollar project or 30, 34 million dollars um, in and essentially going to shift the shift the burden of the decision to the, the voters who are not going to have the sort of detailed information that we've had and then finally uh, I'd like to raise one question if you look at these enrollment numbers they are steadily dropping if Arlington's numbers stay the same and the member enrollment numbers drop we're not dealing with a 33% burden of the capital cost. We're gonna be dealing with 40% or 45% or 50%. So the numbers are gonna actually come out higher than the two scenarios that we saw today. Now, it's been said a couple of times that you can't see into the future. I agree that you can't see into the future, but the Minuteman School District and Mr. Dunn or any of us here don't have a, a special <coughs> insight on how to see into the future. What we have to evaluate is what, the, what are the risks? And what are the risks in light of the other, the other expenditures that we have to undertake in this town? And if we undertake these costs, and they turn out to be higher than our Pollyannish view of what it's gonna be like to build this new building, then we run the risk of losing on some of our other uh, requests from the taxpayers. 
And I think that's a big risk, and I think we have to consider it very seriously. So it's, um, I'd like to make a motion, which um, is that the Finance Committee recommend to town meeting to, that this bond issue be vetoed unequivocally. Okay. Is that a motion? That's my motion, yes. Second. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. My question was, if the, our, uh, our number of students increase and other towns decrease, when it comes to capital, our percentage of the capital goes up, right? Yeah, it's the uh, like I said, it's fifty percent for your uh, average of enrollment. Right. Uh, One percent for each community, yeah. no matter what, and then the others are a wealth-based factor. Yeah, it, it's portioned. Yeah. By okay. that. Okay. So it does go up if we the other towns drop down or now increase. Okay, uh, Alan. Uh, good. Two questions, one one real simple and one maybe not so simple, not nearly as profound as Mr. Foskett's. The simple one is uh, in, in this first model with the 458 in district, how many of those are in Arlington? Is that 200 or reduced proportionally? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on the, the point that uh, Charlie and Dick brought up. Could you restate the question, please? The, in the two models, the, the, one, the one that's 100% uh, in district has 200 students from Arlington. The one that's 458 in district, I, I, I can't find a number for if how many you are go to the back of the, the one, back page? Well, well, what's the number? Uh, 155. Excuse me? 155. Okay. Um, the, the other question is something that I've been going back and forth with Mr. Sharon and Mr. Fulfillment. About it. it's it's uh, in my private sector language I would call it market research. Uh, uh, you mentioned this morning that uh, Minimian accepts a certain number of students and not all of them uh, uh, end up enrolling. And certainly there are students considering Minimian who who never apply. And I was wondering what what answers you get to why they don't apply or why they don't accept. Why don't the role accept it? And, as, and specifically, what I'm looking for is what are the resistances to enrollment which are fixed by this? In other words, if, if, if a student doesn't enroll because the school's too far away, they don't want to ride on the bus, then this doesn't fix it. If there, there, there are probably other things that are not fixed by new programs and new buildings. So I want to understand basically the barriers to enrollment growth that, that you found and how you counter it, how the new building counters those. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, we, we asked that question to, I think, about 85 students. I think it was in the fall of 14 and this fall of 15 who did not come. We contacted again, them again, gave them a little survey. And the top two reasons that the students gave, we asked the students, not the parents, was that uh, my parents thought if I went to Minuteman, I wouldn't go to college. And the second reason, most popular reason, was my friends are going somewhere else. And then uh, the facility was, depending on what town you looked at, was in the top five after, you know, numbers three, four, and five were the facility, the distance, um, and I went to a private school. So those were the five reasons. Um, so you're not, you're, the second part of your question, what does the facility fix about that? I don't know if the facility alone fixes anything, as I said before. I don't really subscribe to the build it and they will come. I believe that our marketing, recruitment, and retention program is really directed towards helping parents understand the competitive advantage that kids get at a vocational school. And I think that message is probably doing more to reduce the barriers right now than anything else in the, in the near term for us. Can you do that marketing and promotion without any building? I mean, yeah. I think sort of all these things. Yeah, we are doing it right now. So, it's, so it sort of sounds like the new building might be fixing one of those five reasons, or maybe one and a half, if students well, go somewhere else. You know, your question was about incoming students. Yeah. If I was asking departing students, 
and their families, what is it about Minuteman you would want to improve? We're actually working on a survey of that form. Anecdotally, kids understand, if you listen to some of what the kids have said about the building, and they've been very involved in the design of the building, um, even though they'll never set foot in it, and never, it is, is that the educational program that we're offering doesn't fit the building. And this is very frustrating to the kids. Um, as I've mentioned many, many times before, environmental technology is on the third floor. You know, robotics, engineering was never imagined in this new building. Um, How many students do you lose every year? How many students move and go somewhere else every year? Uh, there's probably 10 out of the whole school. So it's pretty small. Yeah, it's very small. Yeah. Okay. We retain about 86% from the time they're freshmen to they graduate. I guess part of it is I'm looking for what what would convince what would give us a higher confidence in the enrollment growth, and again I reflect back to if, if I was selling a product I would call it market research and trying to drill down to you yeah. know what market research has been done that's not anecdotal but very specific. Mm -hmm. I think the educational program plan being served by a facility is is absolutely. Foundation. So the question we should be asking ourselves is how, <coughs> much, how well can the new program plan be uh, implemented in the current one? We did look at that as an option. MSBA asked us to do that and some of the stuff that Mr. Foskett was, was talking about, there's another column where if you just repair the building, it's say 70 to 85 million. If you wanted to repair it and address the uh, educational program plan within that building, it was almost double that. <coughs> Okay, other questions or comments? Uh, Carolyn and then Peter. So I'm going to say the same story that I told earlier today, which doesn't have a lot of numbers in it. Um, when, and Steve Don't speak up. Okay. When Steve and I were in second grade, we. <laughs> I like the way people say that. Carolyn and I are the same age. So we went through the public schools here, at the same here, time. Here in Arlington. <laughs> Here in Arlington, he was at a different elementary school than me. We didn't meet till junior high. Yeah. Um, but when we were in second grade, the town voted against renovating the high school. And I remember it very clearly because it was made very clear at the time that the high school wouldn't meet certification by the time I was in high school if it wasn't passed. So the town chose not to rebuild the high school when I was in the second grade. When we were in sixth or seventh grade, the town lost its accreditation. No surprise to anyone who was following it. And um, then when we would have started, when I would have started high school there, and when Steve did start high school there, the construction began. And the construction went on for the three of the four years you were there? Yeah. I, um, two and a half. Two and yeah. a half. And um, I, I chose to go elsewhere. Um, so I, I went to a private school. Um, the amount of money that was spent on the work that was done when we were in high school was significantly more than the money would, that would have been spent back when we were in elementary school. Um, and the quality of the school was at least 30% less than what the quality of the school would have been had it been built back when we were in elementary school. And so when we're talking about whether or not to renovate whether or not to spend the money, um, I think we need to be considering what happens in the long run if we choose not to build a new building. I think history, not just this case, but in many other cases, would tell you you get less for your money, and, you, and in the meantime, you service less kids, poor, more kids poorly. So I recommend that we consider doing this project. Okay. Uh, Peter? <clears throat> uh, being retired and recovering from an eyelid operation, I had a lot of time to uh, think about this. And Hester, the people at Minuteman, who have been very helpful in answering questions and so forth. Um, and I'd like to suggest that not only do we have to consider financial issues, 
but we ought to consider what's good for the town. Uh, Minuteman is a valuable, re valuable resource for our students. 25% go directly into the workforce. Uh, <coughs> it offers a, an alternative to an expensive college education <coughs> where so many kids we hear are not able to get a good job when they graduate. 60% uh, leave the school and, and go to a college, but they go with, uh, it said, and I think it's probably likely, uh, being better, better motivated because they have some stuff in their back pocket that they can use if they need to. Uh, <coughs> Minuteman is a well-regarded school. Um, one measure of that is the report that the accredi accreditation uh, organization gave uh, two years ago. Um, they, they have many different criteria that they judge. Um, the, the school got satisfactory, uh, I don't know what their terms was, but I interpreted it as satisfactory on all but two. Um, the staff was rated as exceptional, and the building was rated as unsatisfactory. <clears throat> Another consideration is that uh, this kind of teaching and learning is valuable for our society. As an engineer, I know how important it is to have well-trained and and intelligent technicians to work with. <clears throat> and as a homeowner, as many most of you are, I know how valuable a good plumber, electrician, carpenter can be. <clears throat> and there, many of the people that are available are not that good. Uh, going on to the cost, to me the cost seems reasonable. It'll be less, it'll be an increase for, of, even in the not so good cases, of not much more than $100 per year for, for most homeowners. <clears throat> uh, the operating cost is expected to decrease because the students that are taking, if, for example, the students taking obsolete courses were not we're to graduate this June. Um, the superintendent has estimated that the cost, our portion of the operating cost for next year would be $300,000 or 8% less than it would be, than it is, I mean. It's also obvious that as the district contracts, the transportation costs will decrease. <clears throat> but the final thing, which <coughs> we've already discussed at some length, is the viability. Will the student attract enough students to fill the new school? This is a key risk, no question about it. <coughs> uh, recently, in the material that we got yesterday or today, the superintendent provided a list of, of reasons that he is optimistic. There are 38 separate reasons, and each one is supported with <coughs> references. Um, <clears throat> he's, already <clears throat> he's already read, uh, uh, recovered some of them tonight. Um, I won't bore you by reading the list, but I find them persuasive. Um, so, the school is important to our society. It's a good quality school. The cost is modest, and the viability is promising. I will vote yes for a contingent uh, debt exclusion. OK, anybody who hasn't spoken before would like to add something or has a question? OK, Dean? So I, I think I want to, I'm not going to actually advocate it one way or another, but I, I do want to sort of call up what I think on a lot of our minds is sort of the, the elephant in the room, right? Which is 
It, it's not about Minuteman. It, it's about having to own the gauntlet that we're about to have to run for school projects, <coughs> right? And it's, it, it, I think for a lot of us, it, it's an interesting time, right? Because it, this is sort of, the, it's, it's the beginning of the moment of truth, right? <coughs> you know, most of us were in this room two and a half years ago arguing against a tax increase, right, that the selectmen conveniently ignored when they talked about their past stewardship of the town. Um, and we said, look, we're on the verge of running a gauntlet. We knew about Minuteman. We knew about Arlington High. The enrollment growth was on the, was on the cover, the first page of the chairman's report. We have enrollment growth. We've got to add um, to our spending. We knew the Gibbs was going to potentially a problem. Kathy Bodie, when we were having the hearing with the school committee, we all recall in March of 2014, said in that meeting, I don't know if the Gibbs is going to be able to hold the kit. We might have a problem. She was cautiously optimistic on the elementary school. She thought that might be a problem, but she was very, the audit, she was very, she was questioning the audit. And so I, I think the frustration that a lot of us are having right now, I, I, I would just, I would just sort of internalize it myself is, is this thought that it's like, look, we go, I could go either way on this, right? Because, but, but ultimately how I want to go is not to get one and lose the others, right? Because that's, that's the worst case scenario of them all is you, you know, like we talked about back in 2014, you get Minuteman, you get whatever the middle school solution is, and then you lose Arlington High in a vote, and you lose, um, you lose the override in a vote. And, and I think that's the sort of the, the scary reality that we're, we're confronted with right now. And so I, I guess what I, what I want to say is that no matter how we go as a committee, we have to own these votes. We have to own the decision making. We have to own our, our opinion because you know, this is a reality that we have been saying is coming for a long time now. And we have been saying to people, this is coming, this is coming. Even when people were saying, no, it, it's not coming, right? I had this great, going back to 2014 in the fall, there was this great debate actually between Mr. Bruderman and then Chair of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Joe Kira, who makes this comment about saying that, you know, these cries that there are all these problems coming, right? The high school, the enrollment, the Odyssey, Minuteman, well, they, you know, they, the Long Ridge Planning ran all these scenarios, seven or eight, and those claims just don't hold water. Well, they do hold water. And we're seeing the reality of that now. And, and so I, I point it out because as a committee, we don't want to abdicate our responsibility for the whole view of the town to these task force <coughs> and committees and stuff like that. I mean, we have, we've held strong so far win or lose, and, and however you, so, so however we vote, we need to own, not just this <coughs> one, but we need to own it all. And we have to realize it's all coming and make what we think are the best decisions. Any other members of the committee? John? John, could you speak up a little bit, please? For, for a very, very long time now, you've heard me uh, talk about Minuteman as being just plain way too expensive. It's well above the tuition for our own students in the Park High School. And uh, what I hope is that with a new regional agreement, whereby Arlington now maybe has much more to say about what's going to go on in Minuteman High School, We'll be able to drive the costs on a per pupil basis down to something equivalent to how Arlington itself is a very good school system, but far less expensive than most ordinary school systems in the, in the state. We do very, very well. We manage very, very well our school system in terms of quality versus cost. That's not true for Minute Minute. Minuteman is at the very highest end of the cost <coughs> for uh, vocational schools. Now we have a proposal for a building, as Charlie pointed out. 
that looks like it's very, very expensive as comparison to other possibilities. And I think that if we vote this tonight positively, we're stuck with a cost that is way too high in comparison to the way Arlington manages its own, uh, its own school system and other things in this town. Minuteman is just plain too expensive, both in terms of tuition and the costs being proposed for this building. And if we vote this positively, we're stuck with something, uh, which is kind of what Dean was just saying. We own it then. So I'm going to vote negative. I'm going to vote choice. And then okay. Tom? Just feel that four or five really critical things are going to come towards us at a very fast time. It's going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money. Fortunately, this is the first one out of the gate. And I'm not going to dispute the numbers and, and renovation to a new. It, it's, if we commit to this, like Dean says, I feel we're committing to either the whole package or somewhere along the line, someone's going to lose. The tax page, in my opinion, just not going to keep going yes, 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 yes. Somewhere along the line, we're going to lose, whether it be a high school, town service, there's something. And unfortunately, Minuteman comes right out of the gate. And, and I can't accept it only because I know there's other important things in this town that we're going to be looking for. So I, I just can't vote against on this for that reason. Okay, other people? Alan? The, the, the concept of ownership has come up a, a couple of times and I guess I want to express the other side of that that I'd feel personally and maybe we should all feel as a committee. If, if the town of Arlington prevents the new building from being built and our justification that a minute man can succeed without a new building, then we in some uh, sense have taken ownership of the future success of minute man. Or conversely, if minute man spirals downhill, then all the fingers are pointing to the town of Arlington. So I just want to, you know, again, I think we have a, if, if, if we prevent the building from being built, then we need to take ownership of making Minuteman the best success we can when a renovation happens, when a $10 million bill comes to build a different type of laboratory or we have to fix a roof or whatever. Let's say we, we're, we, we really have ownership of that now to make it successful. So it's just something that I think we need to consider. Yeah, and at the end of the meeting this morning, Alan said, well, I'm sure it's not going to be a unanimous vote tonight at the Finance Committee. And you can see the, the, the range of, uh, of opinions because it, it is such a, a difficult issue. And I, I walked out with Charlie this morning and said, I can't begrudge anybody voting one way or the other because of the difficulties. Now, I, I voted in favor of it. I'm going to speak a little to that and, and also try to raise a couple of, of new points. Um, but the difficulty here is, is are the unknowns, right? I mean, we know there's roughly going to be about 400 in district students. Maybe we're lucky it gets up closer to 450 or 500, and we've got to fill seats to get up to 628. Because to the extent that there aren't 628 seats at this new school, we're going to be on the hook for roughly a third of every young youth seat. And while the projections are, are hopeful and, and you would think a new building will bring new students. It's an unknown. There's, there's, there's no way around it. Um, it's also an unknown what the new building will cost or what a renovation will cost. But I, I, almost, I look at it, if the renovation is 100 million, even if it's 60, 50 or 60 million, the unknowns and, and the difference between a renovation and a new building to me are worth going forward with the new building. And, and years ago, Carolyn brought up the high school. I'll bring up the Hardy School. Um, the Hardy School originally was going to be a $3 million renovation. It turned out to be an $11 million renovation or a $10 million renovation. And just after that, the MSBA or its predecessor said, once you get up to 50% of the cost of a new building or th through a renovation, you should do a new building because of the unknowns and because of some, some other 
um, just differences in quality between what, what you'll get um, from the renovation versus the new building. So even if the estimates are way off or on, on, on the $100 million cost, um, I, I think it's to a point that if it's a 50 or $60 million renovation without changing around programs, it's still worth having the new building. The other thing we all have to remember is we're still in this district whether we go forward with the new building or not, okay? And, and I haven't seen anybody make a, a, a motion to pull out of the district and we would need a majority <coughs> of the other communities now to, to get out and, and, and state approval. I don't think that's gonna happen. So you have to look at it through the lens of, okay, we're, we're in there. We're not, we're not the water towns looking at it, should we get into this and, <coughs> and weigh pros and cons. We're in, and there'll be costs coming through our operating budget for renovation, whether it's just upkeep or whether it's, it, it's minor uh, capital type improvements that we'll be paying for that will go through the budget process. Um, as Dan said earlier, there's no capital fee reimbursement from the out-of-district students, if that's the case, and there's no state reimbursement. Um, so for all those reasons, and it's a close call, I'm, I'm in favor of this. Now, as far as the others are concerned, I mean, Arlington High to me is my top priority in terms of getting something done. I said in the very first meeting to um, Kevin Mahoney it, it, that if you walked through Arlington High and you walked through Minuteman, Arlington High is in much worse shape. That doesn't mean that Minuteman's not worthy of a new building at this time. And, and <coughs> the, the, the mode of providing education at Minuteman has changed so much from when it was first built to what's required today. And, and the modules that are that required, the building has changed significantly, and and um, you know it just seems while it's close, it feels to me that we should be supporting this. Okay, well, um, <coughs> I might as well throw my two cents in. Uh, I've been involved in the Minuteman process for a long time. Uh, all of Charlie's concerns on, on cost and enrollment, uh, I, I can't argue with them too much, especially the enrollment. I think it's a, it's a challenge. People around the group this morning uh, were concerned with being able to, you know, even if we don't get to 628, I mean, at least getting to 550 or something like that, whether we're gonna have those students. Um, it, those are valid concerns, and uh, if, if those are paramount in your mind, then you should vote no. Uh, I was I was that way a few weeks ago. Uh, I've been listening and talking to as many people as I could. Um, Alan Reedy this morning talking about uh, you know is there a cheap fix? Uh, 40, 50, 60 million. And, and his opinion, I think I'm remembering this correctly, was he didn't think so. That uh, uh, he, he thought it would be an expensive fix. Uh, I talked to Sue Scheffler a few weeks ago, her concern over staff morale, uh, over, over working so hard over seven years to uh, put this project together. It's not something insignificant that could be worked out. Um, I talked to uh, with Paul Schlickman, and I really wanted him there this morning because uh, Paul uh, has an interesting history because for several years he was our representative to the Minuteman School Committee and nobody has kicked the stuffing out of Minuteman more than, uh, than Paul has. And he was concerned with the enrollment, but he felt that the school built back in the 70s for 50s, 60s uh, type of vocational education, it simply could not be adapted, uh, or at least not cheaply adapted, uh, to the new programs, uh, which is the reason he wasn't finally there when we took the vote, but I think he would have voted in favor of it. And uh, Carolyn's piece that she said, just to fill in a few details, back in the mid-70s, uh, the project was posed, uh, proposed to rebuild Arlington High School, including, if I remember correctly, tearing down the A building, uh, uh, several others, putting up new structures, uh, <laughs> including a, uh, I think a new gym and a swimming pool. Field house or something like that, and uh, the uh, individual it was taken to the ballot, and the voters turned it down. 
and then they revised it a little bit, put it back out, and it was turned down again. And so about three years later, we went back and built that monstrosity that we have now with an eight building with pillars in the middle of classrooms. Uh, so we ended up with, as Carolyn said, a lesser building uh, for a substantially greater cost. And uh, that's, that's a risk too, uh, as the risk is with the enrollment. Um, so I, I think after all of that, uh, I, I guess as Dan Dunn said, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, uh, I, I think that the proposal for a yes vote contingent upon a debt exclusion that at least takes the debt surface off the finances of the town and sort of spreads it among 17,000 households at about $100 per household per year, uh, it, it at least seems to uh, modify the risk. So uh, that's why if it comes to a tie vote, I will vote yes. So uh, at that point, we now have a motion on the table. Uh, and so I'll be showing, calling for a show of hands. And Dean is right. It's not any other task force. It's this committee. We have to own the vote that we take. So the motion's been made and seconded for no action of turning down the project. Uh, so if you want to turn down the project, you vote yes to this no action. So uh, a yes vote on the no action turns the project down. Okay, all those in favor of no action, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All those in, uh, against no action, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mm -hmm.